uh, doing this space, um, sort of kicking off this series of events to mark the death of the death anniversary of uh, George Floyd. Um, I remember actually watching the video as we all probably have at some point or maybe through maybe through slitted um, fingers, uh, the video. And um, I don't know, I just, I, for me, and it's probably, I imagine it's been the same for you as well. It just, it was on a sort of body level that I really fe felt it. And uh, I haven't really recovered. I mean, it feels like I'm just coming out of it. It's like a year later. It feels like I'm just sort of coming out of it. Um, so I do want, you know, as we go through this session, so sort of for us to attend to our bodies as well as we go through. Um, and I think for many people, um, it sort of brought home what was really at stake uh, for black people, brown people, people of color. Um, and, it, and if you hadn't already um, kind of really taken it on. And uh, also for many of us, uh, it's kind of renewed our commitment to, um, you know, if we had a commitment to undoing racism, it sort of almost sort of renewed that and sort of drove that uh, forward. I know that was for, how it was for me. Uh, I also want to name three other people who've had quite a big impact on me personally. Uh, they're therapists. Um, and um, they also died um, between the time of uh, George Floyd's death and, and now. And uh, so I just want to sort of share them with you. Um, I'm going to share my screen, but I don't have uh, sharing rights. So if you're okay, Moriam, just to give me ability. Okay, there we are. Oops, you popped off my screen. Hang on. Let's bring you back. Um, yeah, so there was three three people, three men, three black men, actually. Um, some of some, you know, one of them you might know, or maybe all of them even. But uh, the first is Ari Kay, who was a colleague of mine, um, and uh, he was you know, very much associated with Barton. We did a lot of work together, and he. He was the kind of person who I wanted to be, actually. He was in his 70s, and he was fit as a fiddle. And he, he was just this presence. And he had all of these connections with so many people, um, actually, uh, in so many walks of life. And so he managed it really, really well. And so um, I definitely mourn his loss. And another person, uh, Lennox Thomas, some of you might know as well, he... Um, really brought race into the heart of psychoanalysis um, you know, back in the 70s and 80s and 90s um, and was the only one really doing it for a, for a, very, a very long time and sort of carved out this space um, for race to exist in, in, in a sort of psychoanalytical community. He was also my therapist as well for a number of years and he, he passed as well. And uh, Professor Frederick Hinkling, he... Um, he, he, he also died. He, I'm from a Jamaican heritage and um, uh, Hinkling is, is Jamaica's most renowned psychiatrist. And uh, he pioneered what was called cultural therapy, um, which, he, which he hoped that uh, would sort of flip the cultural script for Jamaicans and transform uh, them to some degree into sort of being more mentally healthy and prosperous. Um, he also did a lot of work in the in the seventies. Um, he worked in um, there was a sort of British Psychiatric Institute in um, in Jamaica. He did a lot of work there around the arts um, and around you know, bringing out the stories, making the connections between mental health and uh, uh, colonialism. So I wanted to take uh, I wanted us to take actually just a minute really to. to um, bring to mind George Floyd and anyone else uh, that you know personally that's perhaps been affected by COVID or has died over the last um, bit of time um, and also to send them out uh, some positive regard uh, to their family and friends or prayers if that's your thing. Um, but at the same time as that, I wanted to also maybe attend to the impact that it's having on you, on your heart, on your body, on your mind. Um, yeah, and just yeah, just be, become as mindfully aware as you can of sort of what's happening to you um, as I um, bring these people to mind, and, the, and, the, and that we're entering into this 
space uh, when we're um, talking about race. So I'm not going to say anything. I'm just going to just let a minute pass and um, yeah, just see what comes up for you. Okay, so maybe you might just want to log, um, you know, your experience and just what happened to you right there, and maybe bring it. To, we're going to we're going to sort of go into breakout groups um, for a couple of times, and maybe bring some of that to to those spaces. So there's 18 of us. Um, so you know, uh, it's not a huge number of people. So you know, it'd be good to um, you know make it as conversational as possible. Uh, for today, but um, I'm just going to I'm just going to speak for a bit um, about uh, my experience uh, of discomfort, I guess, uh, sitting with discomfort, and you know, hopefully, some of it re will resonate with with you. I mean, we don't have a lot of time together. I mean, and uh, we always have these little slots of time. So, but but I'm seeing this time that we all have now, right now. Um, sort of coming together to to sit with discomfort and to explore the nature of that discomfort you know so something will happen someone will say something i might say something it brings something up um and you know certainly for me i move in and out of these spaces and uh, the way that i see it is that i'm sort of becoming the more i do that the more at ease I sort of feel with the discomfort and the discomfort doesn't feel quite so intense. Um, and I think that coming in, coming out, coming in, coming out is, is a kind of a medicine uh, for our times. Well, certainly for me. Um, and it's important to acknowledge that, um, you know, you as a group um, and other groups where you might be are, in, are an important part of my journey. And then hopefully, you know, I can be an important part of yours um, in another group somewhere down the road. Um, I'm hoping in time that we have, um, um, I'm hoping at the time that we have, that we can bring some of the ways that you have sat with your discomfort and what healing has taken place, if any, uh, for you in your exploration about race. Um, I'm also to, hoping to hear uh, about what's been achieved, actually. So it's not all about struggle. And, uh, you know, what has been achieved uh, in the struggle to undo racism and uh, maybe bringing those stories out as well. I think the reason I was invited was because I wrote a book called The Race Conversation. I'm not sure if you can see it there. Um, and as you can imagine, I mean, I could have, I could have, I could have called this Sitting with Discomfort. That would have been... The, the title, and that would have been perfectly fine. Um, and, and as you can imagine, just you know, writing a book like that is a big journey. So I want to say something about that journey, and also, um, yeah, hopefully, what I say might um, resonate with you personally, or might resonate with something you've seen. Um, so what I want to do is I'm going to just read um, a little bit. Um, from the beginning, and um, and then I'm just going to unpack each little each bit with my own kind of experiences um, 
and uh, so some of which kind of engender a bit a bit of shame in me, and um, some of some of which um, are kind of just you know, another realization of uh, what's ha actually happening in the world. So I'll just read. Uh, this bit here. <clears throat> so, okay. I found out that there is so much to reconcile within the race construct. I had to reconcile that for white people, acknowledging and responding to the hurt of race was a monumental task. I had to reconcile that white people have a choice to engage or not engage with race and that people of color don't have that choice. People of colour have to engage, even if that engagement is denial. I had to reconcile that the race construct by design is there to dial down empathy towards people of colour and that the darker you are, the more empathy is dialed down. I had to reconcile that the race construct has an array of universal stories that can be picked from its shells and that these stories aid the dampening of empathy. These stories include, we are all the same, aren't we? Or you have the same rights as everyone else. So I don't feel why you're so aggrieved or you need to integrate more or you need to be less angry. I also had to recon reconcile that the race construct has very few universal stories that dial up empathy for people of color or talk into the potential for healing. So I'm just going to, yeah, I'm going to spend a bit of time, um, yeah, just going, going through some of that again and maybe expound and you know, saying a little bit more about each of those phrases and, uh, and, and sort of bringing in my experience uh, as well. And at about, um, what time, about, yeah, in about uh, maybe oh, 40, 20 minutes or so, 20, maybe 25 minutes. Um, we'll um, sort of do a sort of breakout group, and uh, I'll let you know about that. So, um, so for the first part, I had to reconcile that white for white people acknowledging and responding to the hurt of race was a monumental task. So that's the first bit, and um, I guess what is built into that statement is that the race construct creates a sort of a, a kind of pressing demand is the way I like to describe it, uh, to protect um, white people from having to do this work and, um, and, and actually protecting feelings. Um, but this, this demand is, is always with us. It's always with me. It has changed over the years though. Um, I remember, um, I used to do these training trainers forums and uh, they had therapists and, tr and trainers who were, who were training people to become uh, therapists and counselors. And uh, these groups have been run for a number of years actually with Ar Arike, who you saw on the slide earlier. And um, it was a mixed space so anyone could come. And the idea was that they can bring whatever it is from their practice, uh, a sort of live issue something that around race that was sort of happening in their practice in their training in the training space in their supervision or in therapy and um yeah i remember sort of sitting and just kind of and then having this conversation with um uh, this white person who was in the room and I, I started to talk about actually what my feelings were around protecting that person and uh, from, from, from the feelings that were being evoked, I was kind of, are they okay? Are they okay? Um, and sort of not want people to run out of the room. Um, and on one level, they didn't want to be protected. So that was a conversation. But at the same time, they did. And uh, we, I mean, in some ways, it, we're never gonna sort that out. Um, but uh, it was a very important conversation for me, actually, because it sort of got me to um, sort of, yeah, talk, talk directly in, into this thing that was kind of in the shadows for me for a while. 
and it did shift something quite quite uh, and then over time i sort of reflected on on the why why did i want to do this i mean there's so many different layers to it but um and the first being just the program you know just the body program that just happens a non-verbal program that's what you're supposed to do and then the other is a kind of well you know if you do um then you know you might evoke something and uh and sometimes that evoking a feeling uh, is to your detriment. So it could just, it could also a sort of self-protection, I suppose, as well. But then, and then there's tons of other layers on it, but it's sort of, it's, so um, yeah, so that was, um, and I remember as I was speaking about it, there was a, you know, there was a fair amount of shame that came with it as well. And uh, I think that's my experience of kind of being vulnerable in that space with this person. And uh, it just happens as it just happens as a, uh, as a thing. Um, the next two parts of the thing that I read, it was, I, I had to reconcile why people have a choice to engage or not engage. Um, and, um, you know, people of color, black people have to engage. And, um, but not necessarily have to, they can, they could, you know, they are impacted, but they can, they can deny. And, um, I definitely went through that particular phase myself. Um, I had to reconcile also that the race construct by design um, is, you know, uh, is designed to sort of dial down the empathy uh, towards people of color. And also, not more importantly than that, that the darker you were, um, the more the empathy is dialed down. There's a sort of, there's a color, uh, there's a color dial almost. And, um, you know, in those two statements, there's quite a lot there, isn't there? There's this idea of uh, of white privilege. There's this idea of blackness as, as a violation uh, of sort of the cherished um, white values and ideals. Um, and I'm using those terms, blackness and whiteness, um, in quite a loose way. Um, you know, whiteness doesn't live just in white bodies. Um, whiteness lives in, in my body, it feels like at times, and blackness doesn't just live in black bodies, but also in white bodies. So, um, you know, trying not to kind of put people into boxes and certainly have had to work on my own whiteness, you know, and uh, just feeling it rising and, um, and then sort of almost having an internal battle with myself um, within it. So, um, so I'm using whiteness as a collection of ideas um, a sort of a state of mind almost and blackness as a, as a, as a, as a, as a reaction to that state of mind. Um, so yeah, so at one point, I just want to, yeah, at one point, um, um, at one point in my life, I really believed that I wasn't really impacted that much by race somehow I sort of sidestepped it or I, I sort of bypassed it. And um, I could see it going on out there to other people. Um, but of course, that's another state of mind. Um, and as I began to explore race many, many years ago, uh, you, you know, as soon as you start exploring it, you're, you're, you're disabused of that idea that you're not impacted. Um, and even as a white person, um, it's perhaps easier to feel that like you're not impacted as well. Um, but, uh, but the more you, you dig into it, the more you realize that, um, that, that, you know, that actually there is something uh, that's happening to you uh, as well. And uh, so more recently, the, the subtlety of race um, and, the, and the hurt of race uh, have surfaced through following my son through his school life. So my son's now 20. Um, and when he, I remember it, when he was in infant school, watching the school play, it was like a Christmas show. And um, it's a very, we're in Wolverhampton, very multicultural, you know, it's Asian kids and black kids and white kids, they're, they're all there. And just watching the play in front of me, who was in front? Well, so a blonde kid with uh, who who um, you know the kind it was the kind of boy that you would expect to be at the front, 
doing the main lead lines and all that kind of stuff. Um, and the black kids somewhere at the back. And even the staff were organized along racial lines. It sort of felt like the race construct had just organized itself. Everyone just sort of got into, got into line. And I remember watching it and just looking at everyone else and thinking, am I the only one who's seeing what's going on here? But I, I, I imagine it was going on with many people in the room, but we just, we're just not accompanied to, to we're just not uh, used to talking about it and we keep it in our own minds. But I remember being quite struck, struck by that and that image has stayed with me actually for a, a strange little, sort of little things. Um, out of all the big things that I could focus on, it was, it was those little things that kind of, um, kind of stayed with me. Um, and also leading up into secondary school, you know, where's, where's your child going to go? Which school are they going to go in? Um, and there was a number of white families that we knew around, um, around where we are in Warvenstow. And um, then they started making decisions about moving out of Warvenstow and moving into somewhere else. Um, and then in my mind is thinking, well, that's, that's fine. Okay, they want the best school and blah, 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 and they need to move. And blah, 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 blah. But my heart was, was uh, that it was, it was harmful. There was, there was a sort of harm done to, to those relationships that I had with those parents. Not irreparable, not, um, it wasn't unrepairable. But even now, and I go, I go to their houses and I'm reminded of that pain. It's like, okay, I could have gone there with them. But, a, but it's all this playing out of, um, of, of, you know, blackness sort of being, being almost like a stain and we just need to move away from it if we're going to keep, the, you know, this wholesomeness about our, ourselves. So, of course, they moved into white communities um, rather than another, uh, a, a, another sort of mixed heritage or mixed, uh, mixed communities. So, again, that, that, that again stayed with me. Um, and actually, when my son was very, very small, when he was um, two, something like that, and um, I, I made a, a collage of my family, and I just had loads of pictures, and I cut their faces out and put little dogs in, and just completely plastered this quite big um, canvas with photographs of the family and cousins and friends and stuff. And I remember showing it to him, and uh, you know there was. A friend of mine is, is really dark. I mean, the skin is like really, really, really dark. A red top, really, really bright red top. You know, and this, this, it was kind of the face and the body. And uh, my son looked at, looked, sort of looked at the whole thing and then just noticed that and literally was almost scared. And, um, I'd, and it was just quite shocking to sort of see that response um, from him. And um, and again, that again, it's just a little moment. It's just a you know quite a little moment. You could have just not you could have just not seen it. Just that little, and um, you know, noticing my own actually internal body sort of stirring almost. I mean, I don't know, I don't know if it's just me, but there just seem to be a lot more black bodies on the TV at the moment, um, and uh, really dark skin people. Um, on the BBC and on Netflix. And yeah, I can feel my body stirring. That's not how it's supposed to be. You know, I can just sort of feel myself um, sort of moving away from the story and kind of going somewhere else and just, and having, and actually I've, I've, I've had to do a lot of work actually to actively challenge the conditioning in me. And um, so it feels a bit of shame, actually. I feel a bit of shame again rising when I say that, when I talk about that. But um, you know, should I say that? Should I admit that? What are people going to think? Um, and uh, I guess that is a territory of 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 race, isn't it? Of where of where we are. Um, so the the final two parts of that um, reading was um, sort of having to reconcile that there are these stories, these universal stories that they're like, like the race construct is a sort of a series of shelves. And so the dampening of empathy shelf is pretty full of stuff. 
you know you can just sort of pick pick what you want and just apply it you know some of the things i said okay we're all the same you can just pick that one up and say i don't know what the problem is or um i don't know why you're so angry and again you can just pull that up but all that that is just empathy um dampening kind of stuff and um the very few stories that dial up empathy you can pick it up and kind of you know and you can just use it to kind of get to the heart of what's going on because the race conversation on the race construct uh, at its heart really is about moving away from the hurt that people experience so that's the sort of central um function for me and then if you can obviously can if you can move away from the hurt then anything else can happen um and there's also another empty shelf which is healing potential for healing there's there's maybe a one or two things on there you can pick up but you're going to have to really work hard and, and, and fill, it, fill your own shelves um, with the potential for healing shelf and you know the empathy shelf. So, um, so yeah, so that, you know, that, so that was the um, sort of the last bit. Um, and I guess my my own experience of that is of. of of wanting, of sort of trying to um, um, trying to trying to sort of to stay um, stay with the hurt uh, experience, and I, and I found that that actually, especially when I was doing the groups that I, that I do, um, I, found, I found that to be a good um, sort of barometer of where we are in this conversation. Uh, have we sort of floated off into an intellectual conversation and I can do intellectual and have a really great time chewing the cud about all sorts of stuff around race and about other things. Um, and, and sort of, sort of are, are, we, are, we, are, we, are we using our cognition, are we using our cognition right now to find a way to stay with the hurt here or are we using our cognition to sort of move away from it? And it's quite a subtle shift because um, you know cognition is great but um, sometimes it just takes us away from where we need to be and um, and if if things are sort of derailing just sort of bringing people back to that central place and certainly everyone in the space knew that that's what was going to be happening so there weren't there wasn't a big shock uh, when they were sort of like well hang on a second where are we going um, and then they're invited to sort of come to come closer to the contact boundary of their experience, and quite often that was with themselves. Um, so um, and so 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 sort of coming to coming to the self uh, and sort of doing doing something that's going to um, compassionately meet that whatever's happening. Um, and then, and then there may be some space for meeting the hurt that's kind of in front of you, or in front of me. Okay, so yeah, so just some of my some of my reflections, um, my own experience, and I think for a lot of the time, race has sort of appeared to me in that in that kind of way. You know, it's walking down the street and it's, it's funny now with COVID, everyone just sort of moves out of the way. So you're not quite sure what's going on now, but you know, this experience of sort of walking and, and, and people, people's bodies doing whatever they do. Um, and, then, and then, you know, what does that mean? You know, there's this kind of constant kind of narrative. And the more you dig into it, the more uh, you see, but I think there's a point where, um, where, um, something shifts and um, you you kind of on one level accept what's happening in front of you but on another level well, not accept it but sort of say well this is what's going on um, I can't change the world um, at, at this moment or but I might be able to uh, have an impact on it um, if I look after um, certain things look after myself uh, and look after my regulation, look after um, how I respond. 